What's up, everybody? I'm Finn McKenty. This is the Punk Rock NBA. And if you look back fondly on the days of Hurley shirts, Dickies shorts, and wearing red and white blue sweatbands for some reason, then today is your lucky day because we are here to talk about Sum 41, a band that obviously harkens back to the glory days of 2000s pop punk, but has arguably had the most interesting and kind of unusual career path of all those bands. But it feels like they've only recently started to get the credit that they've honestly always deserved as a truly great band that's much more than just a nostalgia act. So how did they go from a bunch of random Canadian dorks from a Toronto suburb to selling millions and millions of albums and becoming one of the most loved bands in the entire history of pop punk? I will do my best to explain that in this video. But first, if you haven't checked me out on Twitch, I'm streaming twice a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays from 4 to 7 p.m. Pacific. There's a link to that in the description of this video. But first, I wanna thank Harry's for sponsoring this video. Have you looked in the mirror lately? Like really, really looked? That beard you grew out last year when you started listening to Deftones, well, it was cool. But you really need to tame that bad boy, and Harry's is here to help. Harry's crafts high quality, long lasting blades and durable weighted handles that make a close, comfortable shave quick and dare I say, even enjoyable. And because Harry's insists that you shouldn't have to choose between a great shave and a fair price, they just give you both. Like refill blades start as low as $2. Easy decision, right? And what's even easier, new Harry's customers get their starter set, which includes a five blade razor with this weighted handle, very nice this foaming shave gel with aloe, and a travel cover. It's over a $13 value, all for $3. So there has never been a better time to try Harry's. Go to harrys.com slash punk to get their starter set for just three bucks. And it is 100% satisfaction guaranteed, so you have nothing to lose. Go to harrys.com slash punk right now to get this special offer. That's harrys.com slash punk. Sum 41 started out back in 1996 in the suburbs of Toronto, founded by their vocalist and guitarist, Derek Wibley, and their drummer, Steve-O. When they were in about 10th grade or so, they originally called Casper, and then changed the name to Sum 41, which was the 41st day of summer and the day that they started the band. Summer started when school was over, and the day we started the band was 41 days after that. The first thing that they put out was a demo in 1998, which was just a demo. But even then it was obvious that they were much better than your average 90s skate punk band. The other thing that's super clear is how much creativity and personality they had from the very, very beginning. But hey man, not only I can get my thing wet, Anybody can get the thing wet, man. It don't matter if you're black, white, yellow, or ugly. Everybody gets wet. And that creativity and personality is actually what ended up getting them signed. After sending out hundreds of demos and getting rejected by pretty much everybody, they ended up shooting a video for the song Makes No Difference, which was like absolutely zero budget, just them like fucking around in their suburban town, playing pranks on people, shooting them with squirt guns, doing the stuff that you do when you're, you know, one of those punk rock kids bored with nothing to do in your lame suburban town. And this was a few years before Jackass, but the video worked for all the same reasons that that show was a hit. You watch that video and they just seem like super fun guys that any like suburban punk skater kid would want to hang out with, right? And on top of that, obviously the song is also really fucking good. So they sent that out instead of a demo and suddenly they found themselves in the middle of a bidding war, oftentimes from the same labels that rejected them before, but that is the power of just one simple thing like that video. And so they ended up signing with Island Records and put out their debut release, Half Hour of Power in 2000. In listening to it now, they've obviously changed a lot, but it's interesting how much they kind of previewed where their sound was gonna go. For example, the opening song, which is called Grab the Devil by the Horns and Fuck Him Up the Ass. It's a metal song that obviously is kind of a joke, but at the same time, you can tell that it's also like kind of not a joke. You could tell that they could actually play metal, which might sound obvious now, but that was really different back then.
But their big breakthrough came in 2001 with the release of their first album, All Killer No Filler. And as everybody knows, the video for Fat Lip. I don't wanna waste my And I think of this video as like the turbo version of Makes No Difference. It was just so much fun. Like it looked like the best local punk show of all time. And even now watching it while I was writing this video kind of made me go, damn, I wish that I was 19 again, hanging out at that video shoot. It was really kind of the perfect punk rock compliment to all the raunchy teen movies that were big then like American Pie and all that stuff. And as far as I'm concerned, it's one of the best music videos of all time. And on top of that, the song was also legitimately fucking brilliant. It was this really cool, seamless combination of like skate punk and metal with a little bit of rap that was actually like pretty progressive in a lot of ways, but also super catchy. You know, people think of this song as just another 2000s pop punk song, but I think it's really a lot more than that. This is like a legitimately really cool track. So Fat Lip put them on the map, but their next song, In Too Deep, is what really, really blew them up. Having one hit definitely gets you somewhere, but having two is what really turns heads, and that is what they did with In Too Deep. And again, a huge part of their success with this song was the video and their personality that shine through. You watch this video and it's just obvious that every single one of the people in this band is hilarious and super charismatic. And how can you go wrong with a classic 2000s pop punk pool video? You can't. And of course, another highlight was Dave's ripping solo in this song, which really set them apart from a lot of these bands, which let's be honest, could barely play. <laughs> So on the back of those singles, the album went triple platinum. It got tons and tons of MTV and radio play, and they were officially a mainstream success. It was really just the perfect album and the perfect set of videos for that moment in pop culture. And personally, I consider this album just an absolute masterpiece on the same level as Enema of the State. And if this was the only thing the band ever put out, I would still think that they were great, but the band was really only just getting started. Because their next album, Does This Look Infected, in 2002, is arguably when like the real Sum 41 really began. It was still pop punk, but much darker and more metallic. Like if you listen to the first single, Still Waiting, the verse of that is practically like thrash metal. And personally, I kind of prefer the more upbeat pop punk kind of songs like My Direction. But at the same time, I understand. I mean, they were like literally kids when they wrote All Killer. A lot of those songs are from when they were in high school. How could they not change and grow up over the years, right? And I think people really appreciated that because at the same time, they were kind of growing with their audience who were probably mostly starting college around this time. So it was a pretty dramatic stylistic shift, but what I think made it work and still feel like Sum 41 is that they still kept their humor and fun. Like even the Hell song, which is about one of their good friends getting HIV, obviously just an insanely dark, heartbreaking topic. Even then, it still had a super fun video that made you smile. And of course, there's the iconic intro to the video for Still Waiting, where they roasted the garage rock revival thing that was going on at the time with all the bands called The Somethings. Sum 41, the number band thing is out, okay? What's in now is the, the strokes, the vines, the hives, the white stripes, the sums. <laughs> the sums? You guys smoke? No. Yeah, you do now. You like that? And this album wasn't quite as big as All Killer, but it was certainly very successful. It did eventually go platinum. And so in some ways, you know, you'd think maybe that was a bit of a step down, but I don't think it's quite that simple because I think that this album is really what set the stage for them to be the band they are today with 20 years of longevity and a fan base would really just take a bullet for them rather than just another 2000s pop punk that had a hit song and then came and went. Which brings us to their third album, Chuck, in 2004, which took the dark, more metallic direction of that last album even further. And throws in some other interesting stuff. For example, the lead single, We're All to Blame, goes from like straight up Metallica. <laughs> To almost like King Crimson proggy kind of parts. It's very ambitious and really shows you what level of musicians they were and how much they had grown, especially compared to their first demo from six years earlier. And on the one hand, it's a huge departure from the more fun, bright, upbeat pop punk stuff of All Killer. But on the other hand, it does make sense if you know the story behind the name of the album. The band went to Congo to do a documentary for a Canadian charity who was helping with the conflict in Congo. You can look it up. Really, really heartbreaking stuff. 
And while they were there, they ended up getting trapped in a hotel room for a few days in the middle of this gunfight between the various forces in this civil war. And they had pretty much accepted that, you know, maybe we are going to die here. Maybe this is the end of the road for us as a band and just as people. You know, that's a very heavy situation to look death in the eyes like that. But they were eventually saved by a UN peacekeeper named Chuck. And so they named the album after him. And this album is also when their guitarist Dave Brown sounds metal influences really took center stage. We had heard hints of it before on some of the other stuff, but this album is when they went like full metal. And again, it didn't sell quite as well as their previous albums, but it certainly wasn't a flop by any means. And more importantly, if you ask most of their fans now, they'll tell you this was the band's best album. But after almost 10 years as a band, things were about to shake up in a big way. Starting with the departure of Dave Brownsound, the guitarist who I just mentioned, and with him, a lot of the metal influences that fans love so much on Chuck and Does This Look Infected. And from reading interviews and stuff, it doesn't seem like there was anything crazy or personal going on behind the scenes. Really just creative differences as far as Dave wanting to take the band in a more metal direction, and then Derek and Steve-O wanting to do more of the pop punk stuff. Okay, we knew Dave wasn't happy in the band for a long time, so when he called to tell us, we, uh, it, you know, it was totally expected. So, you know, we just said that we know and it's fine. It's like, you know, it there's no hard feelings. Lot. And they replaced him with Tom Thacker of Gob, who is a fantastic musician and actually still in the band's current lineup. But without Dave, it really just wasn't the same band. And they started to kind of do some side projects to maybe flex some of those creative muscles. For example, Derek married Avril Lavigne in 2006 and worked on a few of the songs on her album, The Best Damn Thing, with Steve-O playing drums on two of those songs. Steve-O and Cohn also did a side project called The Operation MD with Todd from H2O with a single called Sayonara that's actually pretty good, aside from the weird, cringy, sort of fetishistic kind of lyrics. <laughs> But the band did come back after three years, which was their longest break between albums to date, and released Underclass Hero in 2007, which was really like a conscious break from the more metallic stuff the last few albums, now that Dave was out of the band. Yeah, I mean, we, that was just something that we did, and you know, we just were tired of it, it's I guess. Phase. Yeah, it's a phase. And we're so, done with the phase. I mean, there's some hard stuff on the album, it's just not as much. And it's really interesting how much of an actual, like, conscious decision that was. Like, Steve-O straight up said, this is the direction we should have gone after All Killer No Filler. And personally, I agree with him. You know, listening to this album, to me, this is the more mature, like, adult version of that classic Sum 41 pop punk sound. And I don't know if it's intentional or not, but the lead single actually even has a similar riff and vocal pattern to Fat Lip. So I don't know if that was like a deliberate callback or not, but either way, it felt like the band was back. This album was also their highest yet in terms of chart position, hitting number seven on Billboard in the US and number one in Canada. Although the reviews were kind of mixed and these days the fans really don't seem to like it that much, usually ranking it near the bottom of the list of their albums. And after another long break between albums, they put out Screaming Bloody Murder in 2011, which was kind of another switch, this time going back to the style of Chuck, but with a little bit more of like a progressive, almost theatrical kind of touch. And although I personally prefer the pop version of Sum 41, this album was certainly very well done, the fans liked it a lot, and it also kind of laid the seeds for Dave to come back. He said, Screaming Bloody Murder is a record I heard and I immediately thought I should not have left this band. So the band was still doing well, but all was definitely not good behind the scenes. First of all, their drummer and founding member Steve-O left the band in 2013. As far as I'm aware, he hasn't discussed it or talked about what the reasons were. But I do know that at least as of a few years ago, he was working as a real estate agent in Southern California and these days appears to be living in Australia. And I think this was a huge blow to the band because at least to me, his personality was always a huge part of who they were. He was almost like the co-front man with Derek. And speaking of Derek, he was going through a lot himself. He got divorced from Avril and years of partying finally caught up with him in 2014 when his liver and kidneys just kind of gave out. 
He says, I was drinking hard every day until one night I was sitting at home, poured myself another drink around midnight and was about to watch a movie when all of a sudden I didn't feel so good. I then collapsed to the ground unconscious. He spent like a month in the hospital, but fortunately that was enough to scare him straight. And as far as I know, he's been sober ever since. And in other good news, Dave Brownsound rejoined the band and they put out 13 voices in 2016 on Hopeless after successfully crowdfunding the album. Personally, I'm not really a huge fan of this. I would probably rank this as their weakest album. It almost reminds me of like the Sum 41 version of later Fallout Boy. But that said, it's still a solid album. I mean, Sum 41 at their worst is still pretty damn good. And this is definitely not a bad album by any means. And especially knowing what Derek had been going through in those few years, that darker, more reflective kind of tone completely makes sense. And most importantly, I'm glad that he got out of that dark place he was in. And finally, their most recent album, Order in Decline from 2019, which is almost like the second return back to Chuck in their career, because this album is definitely more metal than pop punk to me. All that we have is just the beat. Again, I prefer their more pop punk side, so this album is maybe not for me, but the fans love it, and I have to say, my own personal preferences aside, it is really well done. The one thing that really impressed me is that Derek actually recorded and mixed this himself, and it sounds fucking fantastic. He is no joke as a producer. And so that is where the band stands today, which brings us to the last question, what is their lasting legacy and impact? Well, the most obvious thing there is that they're one of the flagship 2000s pop punk bands, along with Blink, Good Charlotte, and Newfound Glory. And I think everybody would agree that All Killer No Filler really stands up with the very best stuff of that era. Like, I would say that it's second only to end of the state. And you could argue that in a lot of ways, it's actually better than Enema, or at least more innovative. For example, it really kind of pioneered that fusion of pop punk, metal, and rap that's become so common these days. I mean, this is like every TikTok pop punk band now, but back then that was really kind of unheard of. But what's most interesting to me is that if you look at what their diehard fans say these days, they all point to the band's more metal stuff like Chuck as the high watermark. You know, looking at Reddit, a lot of people actually have All Killer fairly low down their list. So it's almost like Sum 41 have had these like two almost parallel careers. One for the mainstream fans and posers like me who just know them for Fat Lip and In Too Deep. And then one other path for the hardcore fans who know and love them for Chuck. And so regardless of which one you prefer, to me that really just speaks a lot to how versatile they are as musicians. And so maybe more than any band of their era, they got those pop punk kids into metal. Those suburban skater kids who maybe weren't edgy or metal enough for corn, but once they heard Dave shredding it in too deep they were like hey actually this is pretty cool maybe I do like metal and on a more personal note most importantly I think it's very cool to see Derek get control of his addiction issues because I know myself from seeing my mom and a lot of her friends struggle with alcoholism exactly how difficult that is so shout out to some 41 for still holding it down 20 years into their career overcoming so much and bringing so many people so much joy all right, my friends, that does it for this video. Let me know what you think in the comments. Also, I want to thank all my patrons, especially those of you who support at the true cult level or above. Patrons get my podcasts early. I do giveaways. I do Q and A's. There's also a way to have me review your music. Every month I do a call for submissions. If you want me to review something, all you got to do is link it in the comments of that post. Then I will do the review live on Twitch and post it on Patreon for everyone to see. So if that sounds cool, hit the link in the description of this video. And with that, I'm going to sign off for now, but I will see you next time.